maybe you're going to struggle every single day of your life um, with the situation that you have. Uh, maybe you wouldn't yell at your kids, but do you gossip all the girls? Okay. Maybe you wouldn't wear those things. Okay. But it's so true. It's like, what do people say about Christians? You're so judgmental. As we progress in our relationship with Christ, our lives will change. And now, instead of judging when you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we live for is just this one. Good morning. Today should be super fun because we're going to find out if my daughter really likes me. If she thinks I was a good mother, if she didn't think I was a good mother, we're going to find all that out today. So, um, all right. Good morning. To those of you that are here in Phoenix, we are super glad you're with us today. For those of you that are joining us online, apps, Roku, YouTube, any way you found us, we're glad you are with us also. If you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. There you can actually watch the rest of this whole series. You can get past series. We have lots of different guest speakers that come in. So everything you want to know about us is on there. So we are doing a summer series. We're calling it Live Different. We're studying the book of Proverbs, which I will tell you is probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Proverbs is like, ah, this big book of a lot of different things, and it's kind of, it feels overwhelming. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about parenting. And I want to tell you right off the bat that there's two topics that I completely stay away from, and that is marriage and, and children. And, and I don't know why I do that. I think it's just because I know there's people who, who you know, they're counselors or they're authors or they, they're, they're professors in this specific um, art of children and, and marriages. And that, that's not me. So um, I want to show you a picture. And the reason why I'm going to tell you about children is because we've had a lot of them. All right. So this is, this is our family. Uh, the only, I'm coming today not from a standpoint of of I have all this scholarly advice for you because I don't have that. But we did raise seven children. And the age we were talking about, the, the age difference between them, I think there's 20 some odd years between the youngest and the oldest. So when some of them were babies, others were teenagers and others were getting married. And it was this, I, I was thinking how my life feels like it was chaotic for the last however many years. So we're going to talk about children today, but it's going to be with that in mind. So today I want to um, tell you that if you are a parent, I feel your pain. Because parenting is really, really, really difficult. Um, it's, it's, to, it's a very big learning process. And I remember one time sitting in the middle of my laundry room on top of a big pile of clothes that needed to be folded, and I was sobbing. And I'm like, I can't do it anymore. It's too hard. It's exhausting. So I want you to know I, I, I feel that pain with you. When it comes to teaching Proverbs and children, the one thing that we need to realize is this. Teaching children wisdom is actually the most important thing that you'll ever do. It's the most important part of parenting. So today I want to ask you what your goal in your life is for what you're, when you raise your kids. What's your end goal to that? A lot of people would say, you know what, I just want my child to get a good education. I want them to go to the best colleges. Other people would say, I want to make sure that they're a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer or something that pays good money. Some will be like, you know what, I want them to be a professional football player or a dancer or a gymnast or someone that goes to the Olympics. By the way, the Olympics are ruining my life because all, all my shows that I watch, they're not there any longer and it's so frustrating. It's like everyone's on hiatus because of it. So I'm like, I'm trying to have a good attitude, but I don't. Okay. Um, some of you may want to make sure that your kids make a lot of money so that they can take care of you in your old age. So that's not a bad thing either. Um, but other people want um, their kids to grow up and get married so that they can have grandchildren. And because a lot of people live their life through their grandchildren. I don't have to be one of those, but that's okay. A woman went to her doctor's office. She was seen by one of the new doctors. She was a younger doctor. She came out screaming about four minutes later and ran running down the hallway. And the older doctor came to her and said, what, what, what's wrong? And, and she told him, and he went back to the other doctor, and he said, why in the world would you tell my 63-year-old patient that she's pregnant? Like, she has children and she has grandchildren. Why would you do that? You just freaked her out. And he said, well, it cured her hiccups, didn't it? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that would do it. So, <laughs> but... The, the, you have to think about this. If you were talking to your child, if you like sat down with your son 
And he was an adult, and he was very, very, he had a good job, he was handsome. And as you talk to him, you realize all of his friends really, really just think he's, he's so successful, and they're very jealous of him. And, and you remember that he was the first one in your family to go to college. He was the first one to get a really good job. And as you talk to him, you realize one thing. You're like, he's so shallow, and everything he talks about is so hollow. And you begin to think, as you talk to him, who really cares about the stock market? And who really cares about global trading when your, your two ex-wives hate you and your children you don't even spend time with? And as a mom, you would sit there and say, where in the world did I go wrong? Here's our verse. Mark 8, 36. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world that you lose your soul? Because where you and I spend eternity and where our children spend eternity is the most important thing that we will ever, ever teach them. Uh, it's not where you get a job or, or, or the things that you have in life, but it's really an eternal mode of what we have in our children and what we need to teach them, the wisdom of all of that. We're going to put a bunch of stuff on the screen here. We're just going to read this together. Rob Jansen says this. He says, kids will learn the majority of what they know about God from their parents, not in Sunday school, not with the preacher or not from the preacher, not in a Christian school. Who God is and what godly character is all about is taught to us more by our parents than anyone else in our lives. Kids either spend the rest of their lives trying to unlearn the errors passed on from their parents, or they spend the rest of their lives living up to the godly standards given to them by their parents. See, our job, if we're, if we're followers of Jesus, is to raise our kids to know him and to fear the Lord. Our goal is to train them up in the ways of God. Here's our next verse, Proverbs 22, 6 says this, train a child in a way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, we talked about that earlier. That is not a promise. It is a, um, what's the word we used the last time? Uh, it's not a promise. It's a, I can't think of the word of it. Uh, in, in Proverbs, these aren't promises. They're just principles. That's the word I'm looking for that will help guide you and uh, guide your children. But it doesn't mean that he won't turn from it because we know that a lot of you have children that have walked away from God. So it's just a kind of a principle. If you teach them the right way, the odds of them never walking away are pretty good. The word train doesn't mean, oh, I'm just going to raise my kid and just let things happen. The word train doesn't mean, you know, I'm just going to suggest you don't do drugs. I'm just going to make a suggestion there. Training is really, really hard work. And, and Rob Jansen says, we don't train anymore. He goes on to say this. He says, we carpool and sign our kids up for 12 different activities instead. Consequently, we have our kids who play an instrument, kick a good ball, know how to use a computer, and tell their parents where to go. That's basically what it is. So how do you train your child? And I want to go one direction today and talk about this whole idea of, of discipline. And, and we want to go down this road of, we hear this all the time, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I want you to know that that's actually not in the Bible. That was from a poem written in the 1600s by Samuel Butler, which is really interesting. But the Bible does have about four or five verses that do allude to the fact of this rod. So when we hear that, automatically we think, well, the minute I have my child, I need to get my paddle out, get a stick out. Whenever they do something wrong, I'm going to hit them with it. And that's how we're going to make sure that they grow up the right way. So I'll tell you from our experience, I don't think we spanked our kids very much. I asked Cheyenne uh, yesterday, I said, Cheyenne, do you remember us ever spanking you? And she said, I really don't, like probably when she was really little, but, but it was just not something we did a lot of. When they were really little, we had a wooden spoon, and if they got out of line, we'd kind of you know, we wouldn't do it to be mean or hurt them, but we would, you know, we want them to know that we're the boss, basically. But when they start getting older and you can actually have conversations with them, then the whole idea is, is going to be training them, not so much hitting them. I remember the last time that we, I spanked Micah, and he, but I did it mostly out of anger because I was so frustrated with him, and I, I grabbed hold of his arm and I started spanking him, and he started laughing. And I realized he was probably too old to even spank at that point because all his brothers were laughing and they were laughing at me. And I'm like, okay, this isn't so working at all. So we didn't do, do a lot of spanking, but we did something far worse. We stuck them by themselves in the bathroom for 30 to 60 minutes. And that, that was all they need because we'd say, do you need to go to the bathroom? And we meant like go sit on the toilet and, and just stare at the floor. And that's how we disciplined them because they hated that. It, it took them away from all the other kids and it was so, it was just not fun for them. So 
being a mom of a lot of kids, I, I get this idea that, that sometimes you get so frustrated and you take it out on your children. And what happens is that you end up correcting your child, not, not out of correction and training, but mostly out of frustration and anger. And that's really, really easy to do. So I want to talk today a little bit about that before I bring Cheyenne up so we can kind of get a, an idea of what we're talking about. Um, what I'm about ready to say, there's kind of a wide divide out there on people who would disagree with this or not. I tend to think it's really smart. I, talk, I, I learned this from two different men. And, and we want to talk about what a rod actually was and what it was all about in the Bible. Thomas Haller, we're going to just read this too so you can get this. He says this, as an ordained minister, I spent eight years learning the Hebrew and the Greek language so as to study the Bible in its original language. Since that time, almost 20 years ago, I've spent many laboring hours preparing sermons and writing Bible studies on topics of marriage, love, money, miracles, gifts of the Spirit, parenting, and most importantly, the grace of God is seen through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was with great respect for the scriptures that we undertook our call to raise the consciousness of parenting. It is with the same respect and conviction that we offer a look at a biblical perspective on spanking. Christian parents frequently seek the Bible in their effort to raise godly children, and they believe that there's a biblical mandate to spank, and they fear that if they don't spank, then they will commit the sin of losing control of their child. They believe that God has commanded them to spank and that they take spare the rod and spoil the child, literally. But in doing so, they misunderstand the concept of the rod. The following are the biblical verses which have caused the greatest concern. So here's the Bible verses that we're going to talk about. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Proverbs 13, 24. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, 15. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. And the rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to itself disgraces his mother. So at first glance, it seems to be a strong support of the use of corporal punishment, but do they really? Through a clear examination of the Hebrew word for rod, shabbat, and so just so you know that I did look this up, and it, it actually is this word, shabbat, one can see that the Hebrew dictionary has different meanings. It could mean a stick for walking, a stick for writing, a stick for fighting, for ruling, or for punishment. The word shabbat is often used when referring to shepherds who are tending their flock, hence our cute little sheep up here. The shepherds use the stick to fight off prey and to gently guide the wandering sheep. How good is it going to be if you're like, stop it, S stop, stop doing that, instead of, he's going to be like, what, what are you doing? Instead of just taking him nicely and saying, you know what, that's just not a great place to go. I mean, I know if I move him, he's going to fall over. But you're guiding him, you're not hitting him. I guess there's a big, big difference there. He said, please remember that these verses, and I love this, these verses come from a book of poetry. Remember, Proverbs is a book of, of, of poetry. Writers of poetry use familiar words of the day to represent concepts that people to whom they're writing can create an image of what they're writing about. Now imagine when they wrote this, it was Solomon's time. They had shepherds. They had all these things. So in that day and age, they would know what a rod was. It was see, you and I, we think rod means, ah, I need to get that rod out and spank my kid. For them, it, it didn't actually mean that. It meant that, I mean, it could be, but the majority of the time, the rod was something to guide and take care of your sheep. He said, there are many ways that, uh, to hold a child accountable and corporal punishment. Spanking never has to be one of them. It can if, if, if your child is really out of line. He said, reread the passage above and replace the references to punishment and use the rod with the word accountability. And I thought this was really great. We're not trying to change the Bible, but we're trying to change a word that, that helps you get an overall view of as a shepherd, he's trying to make his sheep accountable for where they're going. If you go that direction, you're going to fall off the cliff. So I need to, to move you to where we need to take you. I don't need to beat you to do that unless you're a really, really bad sheep. He looks kind of cute. I don't think he's a bad sheep. He's a sweet sheep. For example, Proverbs 13, 24 would read this. He who spares accountability hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but holding him accountable 
will drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, do not withhold discipline from a child, but if you create a culture of accountability, he will not die. Create accountability and save his soul from death. So see, see the difference? It's not like you're beating them. You're trying to train them. It's a, it's a huge difference. Proverbs 29, 15 would read, the culture of accountability imparts wisdom, but a child left to itself whatever it says, uh, disgraces his mother. Our job is to parent and teach our children that when they make bad decisions, there's huge consequences for that. And so we can do that a lot of different ways. Nowadays, oh my gosh, you could take your kid's phone away from them and that would destroy them. You could take their video games, you could take their computer, you could ground them, you could do all of these other things. And, 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 and granted, if they're really bratty, I mean, of course, you might need to spank them. But for the most part, each child is so different. And that's the other key to what we found out about with all of our kids. They're all different. We had some that were so strong-willed, and those are the ones that, you know what, we probably did have to spank them a little bit older. If I looked at Cheyenne or Dusty, if, we just, if I just went like this, okay, she would know like, oh, mom's not very happy with me, and she's not going to do anything. She's just going to do what we say because she doesn't want to make us unhappy. Um, for some of them, it took a spanking. To some of them, it was just like you stick them in the bathroom for 30 minutes. So it's just, you have to figure out what kind of child that you have. If you're dealing with a very rebellious child or someone that isn't rebellious, there's a, there's a huge difference. When our son Jesse went to Wheaton, they have to do this like, I think it's like a, 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 love, a couple mile run. I don't remember what it is. Under 11 minutes, I think it is what it is. But they were having a problem because the linebackers were all so big and they weighed so much more so they couldn't run as fast as the, as the running backs. And so it made it a really hard time for, to, to, for the uh, linebackers. So they changed the rules. The linebackers, depending on their weight, the rules were changed for them. And so I think that's the key. You have to know your kids' hearts. You have to know what they're like so you know that you have to maybe bend the rules a little bit for different kids because they, they think differently and they are different. Danny Zacharias is another guy that I was uh, reading about. In his post on parenting, he says this, to reiterate, we should not spare the rod from our children. I'm not saying, please do not hear me say you shouldn't discipline them because I don't believe that. Discipline is important. But um, he said, to reiterate, we should not spare the rod from our children, but in proper biblical context, I think it looks different than it's been traditionally assumed, like that you just get a rod and hit it. Here's a couple screenshots here. The rod was constantly in the shepherd's hand as he walked in front of the sheep to lead the way. Isn't that awesome? It's like he wasn't behind him, you know, telling him, go do this, go that. He was leading him. The next one says this, the rod corrected the course of the sheep because sheep were distracted. The rod was used to push and guide them back the way we're supposed to go. Kids get distracted. That's just the way they do. It's our job as parents to, to push them, lead them, guide them, not just hit them every time they do something wrong. Striking the sheep is the next one would actually be counterintuitive as it may slow down the animal and it may make him wary of the shepherd. And I thought that was really interesting because you don't want your kids to, to be scared of you. Like you want them to have, like we have the fear of the Lord. But we don't, we're not scared of God, but we have this healthy, respectful fear. We want our kids to have healthy, respectful fear of them, but we don't want them to be terrified of. There's a really big difference there. Here's the next one. A rod was used to remove sheep from harm or corral a stubborn sheep. The next one is a rod was used as a weapon against predators. It was not to hit the sheep, but it was to hit rather the wolves and the mountain lions that threatened the sheep. Um, I was thinking about this the other day and I thought, it's our job as parents to protect our children. And, and you have to keep this out. And, and we'll talk a little bit with Cheyenne about this, but we had one kid that Dusty was hanging out with and he started smoking pot. These kids were like in eighth grade. And Rob sat down with Dusty and said, you're not hanging out with him if he's smoking pot. And so Dusty came over and he came back and he said, you know, my friend's not smoking pot anymore. Can he come over? So the friend comes over and Rob goes on the patio and sits down with both of them. And he says, I will tell you this, as long as you are not smoking pot, you can hang out with my son. The minute I hear differently, you will never be allowed to hang out with him again. That is what we do. There's, there's people that want to harm our children out there. And we as parents have the ability to say, no, you cannot hang out with them. And you talk to them. You don't just say, you can't hang out with them because I'm telling you to hang out with them. No, you explain to them why and even bring the friend in. And within another month or so, the kids back smoking pot and Rob says, we're done. You're not hanging out with my son anymore. And they never did the rest of the year. So, or the rest of the time of his life. So that's kind of our, our, what we're supposed to do. Here's the last one. A rod was an extension of the hand. It was used to lift and carry a sheep 
or to push back wool to examine the skin for injury. The rod was something that was, for the sheep, it was a loving thing. It was, it was to, to help the sheep grow up and, and be protected. And that's what I think parenting looks like. Now, I'm going to bring Cheyenne up, and we're going to chat with her. Uh, this is my 23-year-old daughter, if you do not know Cheyenne by now. And um, I want to talk to her. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, because she actually works with high school students and uh, in, at, at uh, church. And she will tell me the craziest things, and I'm like, what is wrong with parents today? Like, I don't understand it. So this is why I want to have her kind of talk to us a little bit about what goes on. Because here's what we realized. There are two things that's going to happen that's going to destroy your child. And we want to talk about both of them. One of them is legalism. And the other one is, what is the second Leniency. one? Leniency. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to, and, and I want you to tell me what that looks like because you work with kids all the time. And you see, you, you see the parents are disasters. So yeah. tell me about that. Yeah, so I work with high school girls, and I get a really good picture into their home lives. They talk to me a lot about what goes on at their house, how their parents parent them, and all of them are different. But from what I've noticed, a lot of these kids grew up in the church, and their parents are very legalistic. Um, they're not allowed to have Facebook. They're not allowed to have Instagram. They're not allowed to have Twitter. They're not allowed to have Internet. Their parents have completely cut the Internet off of their phones, um, they can't hang out with anyone past 9 o'clock. And these are high school girls. I mean, they're 15, 16, and they're not even allowed to go out past 9 o'clock. Um, their parents monitor the doors at the house, see when they're open and closed if they're not home. I mean, it's just insanity. And these girls are insanely rebellious. They're sitting here telling me all these things, and they're like, but it's fine. I already figured out how to get internet back on my phone without them knowing. Or it's fine. You know, we just lie and say that no one came over. And I mean, kids are smart. They're really good at conniving their way out of things. But um, all I see is that the legalism, if it's doing anything, is just pushing them farther away from their parents and um, making them want to be rebellious. Did we have a lot of rules and regulations for you growing up? No, there was a lot of freedom um, with you guys. I felt like I always could make my own decisions. There was definitely conversation. So in, in the realm of dating, for example, it was never you can't date or you can't date this person or you have to wait till you're 18 to date. There was never a rule about that. It was um, I would tell them about this guy and, you know, they'd say, okay, well, here are our red flags. This is what we think. Ultimately, this is your decision, but you know, this is the consequences of dating someone that's not a Christian and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I had the freedom to make my own decision. And so having that freedom really helped. And there are times that I made mistakes, but once I made those mistakes and realized, wow, mom and dad were right it led me to not want to make the mistake again and to listen to them the next time because I, they were right the first time. And, and that's when I got the rod out and literally beat her if she brought them home. So see, it, it worked out. <laughs> um, but I, I feel like in a weird sense that it, it ruins a child's relationship with God. Because if we're so legalistic with our kids, then somehow that moves into this whole realm of God. And they're not going to want to have a good relationship with God if we're not giving them um, good, what am I trying to say? Yeah. yeah, so I feel like, for example, the girls that I work with, um, the legalism makes them want to rebel against their parents. And the first thing that their parents want them to do is love the Lord. But if they're wanting to rebel against their parents and their parents want them to love the Lord, they're going to see that as an opportunity to just run the other way. Um, another thing is they're going to think God is legalistic. Um, I get girls asking me all the time, but is it a sin if I drink? And, you know, I say, well, once you're 21, no, you, you know, you can have a glass of wine, but, you know, and I talk to them, but their parents are like, no, 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 no. And they don't talk about, you know, what the Bible says. And so I think that that causes them to have some animosity towards um, the Lord in a sense. Perfect. Um, on the other side of that coin is leniency. And that's where we're just, we just let our kids do anything. Like you have friends. Talk about some of your friends like this yeah, that, so, with their parents. Yeah, growing up I had a lot of friends that their parents were Christians, but they almost wanted to be 
the friend of their child. And so they would say, you know, you can drink before 21, but you have to do it in the house. Or, you know, being drunk is not a sin. Or, you know, you can stay out past midnight with any boy you want. And there was just lenient rules. It's not that you need, it's not that they didn't have legalism, that you should have legalism, but there's also the other side of leniency. There shouldn't be uh, no rules in the sense of you can kind of do whatever you want um, because it ruined, it ruined a lot of my friends. I see them now and they kind of just think they're living a godly life, but they're out partying all the time because in their head, their parents said that that's okay and that that's biblical, but it's not. So, right. Yeah, and I think it's really training your kid to what, is, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? And I think that's our big thing. What, what does it really mean? Like, like okay, if you, if you tell people you put a, a Facebook you know, post of a Bible verse and then two seconds later there's a big picture of you drunk at a party, like there's, there's, there's this disconnect there and trying to teach the kids that, that if you want to follow Christ, that, that you need to live that, live that way, live those actions, not out of legalism, but because you love Jesus. But sometimes that doesn't happen until later on in the kids' lives. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put some stuff on the screen. Danny Zacharias wrote these, and then I'm going to have Cheyenne comment on them. Here's the first one. Uh, we lead our children by teaching and modeling the behaviors and values we expect. If you want to see or change an attitude, action, or behavior in your child, change it in yourself. Now, that's one of those things like we just tell our kids, you need to do this. You need to not drink, but mom's getting drunk and, you know, all day long. You need to not smoke pot, but you come home and the house smells like marijuana. Like, there's all these things like you're just kind of like, if you, you're telling your child to do something and yet it, you're not doing it yourself. And so how valuable was it for, for you that, that a parent live what they teach? Yeah, so I was talking to um, my mom the other day just about how, I don't even remember when I was really little them, you know, harping God on us. It wasn't like you have to read your Bible and you have to do this when I was young. I just, my childhood, I remember them talking about God and always waking up and seeing them read their Bibles or their Bibles being laying around the living room. And for me, that was huge. Just having that example at home and seeing them live it out. Anytime my dad got upset, he would call us all into the living room, sit us down, apologize to us, constantly living by example. And that was huge. Um, a good example is a lot of, I went to, I grew up in private school and I'd say 80% of the people that I went to school with have completely walked away from their faith and I can attribute it to their home lives. Yes, they went to a Christian school and they learned about God all day, but when they went home, they, their parents weren't living it out. So why should they? And so I attribute, you know, a lot of them walking away from Christ because they didn't see it in their home life. Yeah, it's really, really important. I think that's the one thing is that you have to live it and you have to be able to communicate with your kids. What's the next one up here? Um, explain uh, the expectations you have of them, uh, telling them why. Like, I expect you, as you go away to high school, to, to do this specific thing, um, but not because I tell you, but, but why. I don't want you to go to parties and drink and get drunk because I don't want you to get in a car with some strange person and get in a car accident. Like, how important is it for us to give us the why? Yeah, it's super important because if someone just tells you not to do something um, and they don't tell you why, you're kind of just like, okay, well, you're not giving me a reason why not to, so why wouldn't I? Um, and that was something with you guys, you always taught us the consequences and it was like, okay, you know, if you go out and party and you drink, you don't know what could happen. You know, someone could take advantage of you or they can, you know, drive you in a car and hurt you or you can get in a car accident. And these are all the consequences that could come from going out and partying. And it wasn't just don't party. It was, this is what's wrong with partying. This is the consequences. But in the end, it was our decision. You know, I mean, of course we knew they didn't want us to, but in our head, if we ended up doing it and the consequences came about, we would see that, you know, they were right and they were just trying to help us. I think it's giving their kids the freedom to be able to make mistakes on their own. I'm telling you, your kids are going to make a lot of mistakes. They're going to do some stupid stuff. Yeah. And you, you, we'll talk about this at the end. You can't be responsible for that. If you raise them up and you teach them, they're, they're going to do dumb things. I guarantee you that. Um, what's the next one up here? Um, and the sheep, and like the sheep in the front of the pack who gets to the feeding trough first, catch your kids doing right and affirm it. How important is it for parents to say, good job, you're awesome? So recently I've been going through um, this thing called spiritual strongholds. 
And a lot of my spiritual strongholds are fear and rejection, not because of anything my parents have said to me, but a lot of my friends over the years, things that they've spoken over me. And I've realized going through this, how important it is to speak life and affirmation over your children. Because even when you don't think that you're hurting them, you really can be. I mean, just even saying like, you're so annoying or stop talking or leave me alone. I just want to be in quiet. At the moment, they might not think much about it, but inside it's building up in them and it's causing them to feel rejected in the inside. And that can kind of come out later in life as I've seen. Not And like I said, not anything that they've ever said to me. They've always been very affirming, but hearing it daily by my friends was what kind of ruined me. But it's so important to constantly affirm your kids. And I think it's more important to affirm your kids than like discipline them in the sense of if you see them doing something right, always affirm it always, always, always affirm it and give them love and show them that they're doing the right thing and that they're doing a good job because that's what's going to help them grow to be a confident um, person. I kind of like this. You're kind of making me sound like I was a good mom. <laughs> you are I really a good mom. wasn't that great, trust me. Yes, All right, uh, let's go to the next one. Furthermore, uh, the parents as the primary caregivers need to also be the primary influencers. We have made the mistake that thinking kids need more time with their friends to the point that we think teens need their space. Next one, but it is um, adults, those who have become wise with age and experience, who should be the primary influencers through the entire journey to adulthood. So do you think that you need more time with us or are we okay with giving you the time to be with your friends? I think there's a time and place for family time. I mean, if you think about it, your children are with you all the time, their whole life, especially before they're driving, they're with you all the time. Um, But I think it's important to let them go and be with their friends and um, have that freedom to hang out with the people that they want to be around. And, you know, they see you at dinner, they see you on the weekends. And I think just forcing them to stay home and forcing them to be around you, forcing them to be your friend is probably not the best idea because again, I think it's just going to make them resent you. Yeah. You don't get to be friends with your kids until no. at least 23. 23. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, now one big thing for, for kids, especially as they're growing up is communication is huge. You have got to keep those lines of communication o- o- all open all of the time. Um, when we did not like your friends, or we did not like your boyfriends, we would not just keep quiet. We would say, nope, we don't like him. And this is why. Like, this is not happening for, for our family. And I can't tell you how many kids, um, they, they literally broke up with, with their, their boyfriend or girlfriends because we, we were so adamant that we didn't like him. And it, it wasn't because we, it was just because that we could see something that wasn't right. Parents know that. But there's a lot of kids that don't have that relationship with their parents. So if they don't, and you walk in and say, hey, we don't like your boyfriend, you need to dump him, they're going to be like, who are you? So I think communication on all forms is, is really, really important. Um, you were good at listening to us. You, you just kind of always were. But there are children that don't. What do you say to the parents to that? Get the rod and beat them? (laughs) Get the rod and beat them? No. I think just being persistent, but always loving them through um, their mistakes because that was the only reason that I was so open with her and so easy to communicate with her is because the first time when I was pretty young and I came to her and I told her, hey, I, I, you know, I messed up. I did this. She didn't say, oh my gosh, you're a horrible child and you're grounded and this and that. She was just like, it's okay. We all make mistakes. Like you're forgiven and, you know, Christ took care of it on the cross and let's move on and let's learn from it and not do it again. And so from then on, it was like, I just knew I could talk to her and be open communication with her and she could do the same for me. And I knew she was always doing it out of love. It was never her trying to, you know, hurt me, say that I, you know, oh, you can't date him because she was mean and she didn't want me to date anyone. It was because she loves me and she, you know, saw something that I didn't see. But that, I mean, I'm not acting like I was a perfect child. There was definitely times that I (laughs) dated guys that they did not like and I continued to date them. But it ruined our relationship. I mean, the guy I dated in high school, her and I didn't even barely talk for three months because I was dating him. Not because we were mad at each other, but because I knew they didn't like him and I knew what I was doing was wrong. But you know, I just, I wanted to kind of do my own thing. And I learned from that. And then the next time it was easier to listen to them because, you know, Mm -hmm. I learned from my mistakes. And like she said, I think it's so important to let your children make mistakes. Don't be afraid because they're going to make, I mean, we're human. They're going to make mistakes. 
let them make the mistakes, but then be there to love them through it and communicate with them and talk to them about it. I told her yesterday, we were talking about this, and she said, I said, here's the deal with parenting. I said, you, you don't fall apart when your kid does something stupid, because they will. And, and what you do is you come along and you pick them up and you pick up the pieces with them. And that's what you got to do as parents. If you're constantly, you know, how could you do this to me? And I'm, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. You will, you will destroy them and you will destroy your relationship with them. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, we correct the course. Stay firm with your kids and stick to the boundaries as you set. The phenomena of parents giving empty threats, not following through and not actually meaning what they say seems to be epidemic. Children have learned to just get what they want via whining, tantrums, crying, or just ignoring. Parents are supposed to be ones in charge. You babysit a lot of kids who do that, don't you? But my question is, is how important is it for us to say, no, if you do that, you're going to go to your room or you're going to get this taken away. Parents don't like to follow through. No, they, they need to because then you know that they mean business. <laughs> Um, if I, you know, like she said, they put us in the bathroom. You guys, that was the worst punishment ever. I literally would like sit there and I'd count the tiles for an hour. That's, I mean, it was horrible, but you know, when I made a mistake and you know, I was being a little brat and they told me, you know, we're going to send you to the bathroom. And then I kept whining and they'd say, okay, 10 more minutes. I mean, Okay, and then I'd keep whining, no, 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 10 more minutes, and they just keep adding on time, and it was no amount of whining could get me out of it. It was just adding on time for me to be punished. Um, they, never, they, they never came back on their word either. Like, I could sit there and just say, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, that was, I should have done that. And they're like, okay, we forgive you, but you're still going to the bathroom, <laughs> so have fun in there, you know? So it's like, yeah. just don't give back on that word. Cause once you do it once, they're just going to think they're going to be able to manipulate you every time. Oh yeah. Kids are so manipulative. Um, okay. Real life is filled with consequences, both good and bad. Your children's bosses and teachers will all, um, will all keep their word instead of physical correction, like beating the poor little sheep. We discipline by giving natural consequences, just like life. So I was thinking about this. Dusty just got a ticket uh, a couple weeks ago. Now, the natural consequence is not that he comes home and says, Mom, I just got a speeding ticket and blah, blah, blah. I don't take a rod and hit him. We say, oh, guess what? You're going to driving school. And so tonight, he gets four and a half hours. He goes to school. He works. He's exhausted. And now his consequence is that he has to go to driving school. So it's kind of a natural thing. If you don't show up at your work, you're going to get fired. That's a natural consequence. If you don't study for a test, you're going to like flunk. Uh, training a child means being able to try to say, look, if you do this, this is going to happen. This is going to be the consequence to that. What's the next one? Uh, we keep a watchful eye. Parents watch and encourage and teach their children how not to stray. How important it is for us, or is it, to talk to you about sex, drugs, pornography, all of those things. Like, what, That's our job to teach you not to stray. Yeah, it's really important because if you're not talking to your kids about it, they're asking their friends about it, and their friends are probably not the best source of information. And I get this from my high school girls all the time, sitting there talking with them. They're like, hey, um, I have a question, and they'll ask me a question about sex or dating or whatever it may be, and I'm thinking, you know, their parents are strong believers. They work in the church. You would think that they'd be able to ask their parents these questions, but they're so afraid because their parents are so legalistic. Um, and don't have that open communication and aren't leading them. And so they'll ask their friends and they'll come to me and they'll go, my friend said this about this. And I'm like, oh gosh, no, that's like, that's not it. <laughs> and I have to, you know, kind of help them and again, lead them and help them not stray. But ultimately, I mean, that's the parent's job. They're the ones that are with them all the time and they need to be hearing that from their parents. I remember our, our oldest son, he came to me one day when he, he was pretty young and they'd gone to Wet and Wild, the, 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 park and he comes home and he said my my friend just said he and his girlfriend had sex going down the slide and I was like really that would be really interesting have a seat and let's talk about it. because he's just hearing all this stuff and it was my first indication that we need to have like sex talk with him but I'm like but he's hearing this crazy stuff from his friends and and I think this world today with these kids oh my gosh they are hearing some goofy crazy stuff I don't know how we're doing on time probably not really good oh we gotta go um, all right. Uh, do, do we, we talked about that. Um, I don't know. Uh, how can we protect you without turning you away from us? Because we, you know what I'm saying? We don't, I don't want to make you mad at us. I want you to love us, but we want to protect you. But 
but if I tell you, no, you can't hang out with that friend, you're going to be mad at us. Yeah, well, that's sometimes, that's life. I mean, there's been ten, plenty of times where I've been mad at you guys. I mean, just like a good example, my boyfriend in high school, I mean, I broke up with him and they said, okay, you broke up with him. You're never allowed to see him again. You're never allowed to date him again. And I remember I wanted to get back together with them and they were like, nope. And I was so mad at them. So mad at them. I mean, like furious. And looking back now, I'm so thankful that they told me I couldn't see him anymore. So I think in the moment, yeah, they're going to be mad at you, but it's like, okay, whatever. You know, they're going to be mad at you for a year or a couple months, whatever. But in the long run, <laughs> it's so much better. In the long run, it, yeah. it saves them. So I think it's... Well, yeah. It, yeah. We got to know that. Okay. Um, how important is it for, ki- for parents to apologize to their kids? I think it's very important. Yeah. If, you, if you're not an apologizer, if you do something stupid, please apologize to yeah. your kids. It's very, very important for them to see that we are human too and we yeah. make stupid mistakes. Um, talking about phones really quick, uh, what about, uh, what were we talking about that? Don't go through your child's phone. Okay, that was the question. Don't, yeah. don't do phone checks. Don't do, they're going to, they're really smart. They're going to hide things from you no matter what. So you invading their privacy is just going to make them more annoyed with you and more rebellious. I have high school girls that their parents cut their internet off and they already know how to get it back without them knowing. They won't let them have Snapchat. They have it. They just delete it when their parents are around. Um, I mean, just tons of things like that. They're smart. They can hide things. So, and, and if they don't have it on their phone, they're just going to go do it on their friend's phone. So it's like, I just think invading their, you never, you've, they've never looked at my phone once. They've always given me the privacy of having my own phone. Um, but if you're worried about on the internet, there's apps that block things and there's apps that keep certain sites away and just, you know, utilize those, but don't, don't start going through their stuff. Cause then they're going to feel like you don't trust them. How important it is for, for me to say, Hey, last night you went out to that party. Um, did you do this? Did you do that? Do that? How do we do that as parents or is that none of our business? I think you should give them the freedom to come to you because, you know, in the beginning, you never asked me those questions, but I felt like, I just felt like I wanted to come to you and openly talk to you about it. I feel like when you start asking them questions, it's just going to leave room for them to start lying about things because they yeah, don't want to be true. open about it. I don't know. Does that answer that yep. question? Yep. Um, how can we, t- this will be our last question. Uh, how can we talk to our kids about Jesus without turning them away from God, because especially Christian, we're so desperate for our kids to want to know Jesus, to to get to know Jesus. So everything becomes a verse. Everything becomes church. Everything becomes, you got to be in church five times a week. You're constantly, you know, is that good or bad? I think, I think a healthy level of that is good. Um, You guys always, you know, said, you know, you should be reading your Bible, you should be learning, and, you know, you should really get involved, but you never forced us. Um, I don't know. I just, I think that, can you repeat the question? Okay, but, okay, so. Do, I forgot the beginning of it. Do we pour Jesus all the time? Like, well, Jesus said, don't do that. And no, you shouldn't no. shouldn't do that. And Jesus says, and, and do I've that. told you before, You're like, I, I would Jesus. come to her and be like, I'm really sad because I broke up with this guy. And she'd be like, oh, but, you know, the Bible. And I'm like, mom do not bring up the Bible right now. Like, I know that this is in God's hands. I get that. But I just need to cry about it and I need you to love me. That's what kids want. Like, they know that (laughs) the Bible says that and that God's taking care of them. You don't need to reiterate that 400 times. They just want you to love them through it. Does that make sense? And I think once you do that and once you, you know, are living it out for them, they'll see that. They don't need you to constantly keep reminding them and keep forcing it upon them. Okay, because I think it probably does more harm than good. I think there has to be a really healthy balance. I, I feel like I used to have bitterness towards God in certain times because they would just constantly be like, well, this verse and this verse, and I'd be like, I don't want to hear the verses. Like, I just want you to love me right now, like, through my sadness. Right. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's perfect. All right, um, Melody, we're going to go all the way to the very end uh, with those last three or four screens. Um, Here's what I want to just say to end this whole thing. Four quick things. Give yourself a break. You got to do that as a parent. Um, it's parenting is very, very difficult, but the best thing you can do is your child is born. They come out of your womb. You hold them and you say, dear Jesus, they're yours. Like you've got to take them from here. I can't, I, I, I'm going to do the best I can, but I'm going to fail and I'm going to do stupid stuff just like they're going to. I need to give myself a break and don't be so hard 
on yourself. Our job is to take the rod and guide them, not to beat them. Because I'm going to tell you something, they're eventually going to leave your house. They're going to go away to college. They're going to have to make these decisions on their own. And a lot of times they're not going to make decisions that you and I want. We had kids go off to college and literally go straight off the deep end, smoke pot, drink, get drunk, have girlfriends that we didn't like. And, and I'm just like, who are you? I did not raise you like that. But I had to come to the realization that, you know what, God, you have to change their hearts. I can't. And, and I got to give yourself a break. Some parents so beat themselves up all the time and they're miserable. Don't do that. Um, uh, Dusty, a part of, part of that uh, training, Dusty ha hasn't been to church in the last few weeks. And and um, he's been snowboarding because of snow, you know, it's th those kind of things. And Rob just sat down with him the other day and he said, Dusty, here's the deal. Love you. Love that you're snowboarding. Love that you're having fun. But, but you got to be in church. If you are going to live at our house, I expect you to be at church. You have to because that's my job in hopes that somewhere at church, something is said that the Holy Spirit will grab a hold of your heart. And, and you can make those rules. Like as long as you live here, you need to be in church. Now, what they do with that, that's not your responsibility. That's God's. Second one, we talked about this already, do not be legalistic. That will destroy your children. Next one, do not be so lenient that your kids won't know what it means to follow Jesus. The whole goal is to get them to love Jesus and follow him. Um, and then the fourth one is, is this, to pray and trust. You got to pray, pray constantly. God, if my kid's doing something that I need to know about, you need to let me know. Um, we did this one time with, with Micah. I trusted him explicitly. I just trusted Micah. I don't know why. Someone came to me one day and said, Micah did this today. And I'm like, Micah would never do that because, of course, our children, they would never do things like bad. So I asked him that night, and he point blank lied to me. And I was so shocked. I was like, my child is a liar. I, I, I didn't even know how to even process that. But here's what I realized. We cannot freak out at our children. Don't do it, okay? We just buy into that whole thing. Here's what I want you to know. Talk to them, guide them, love them. Our children did not really get great relationships with God. Most of them not at 10, 15, 18. That didn't happen, okay? They came to know Jesus more at 25, 30, 35. That's how it works. So you train them, you pray for them, and trust God that he will change their heart. And this is what our prayer needs to be. Dear God, would you please give my child a child just like them that drove them just as crazy. And, 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 and then we just pray for that for our kids, see? So then that way God can give them the horrible feelings that we've gone through for the last 20 years. <laughs> so thank you so much. I'm so happy that you were here with me. We should do this more often. Aww. Let's pray and then we'll go. Father, thank you so much for, um, for this time. Thank you for being able to share Cheyenne's heart and seeing what these kids go through nowadays. I pray you'll help us to be great parents because we want our kids to know you, but we don't destroy them by, by being so legalistic or so lenient. Help us to know that there's a fine line. I pray, God, that you will give us the wisdom to know how to do that. Um, thank you for these women that are here today. I pray, God, that you will just change lives, change the way we look at how we raise children, and it will be God-honoring so our kids will always come back to want to know you because we raise them the way you would have us to. In Jesus' name, amen. He had a choice on how he was going to respond to the rest of his life. And it's the same with you. And don't let Satan win. Honestly, what you need to do is say, let's start a compassion ministry. And what we're going to do, he has a billion stars he's, he's, he's in control of. He can deal with your and that God's saying, I don't want that. I want you to, to, to treat me like you would treat your best friend. Those are real feelings that we think we ought to keep to ourselves like shh we can know god where we can't know he knows